Again, thank you for being here today. We appreciate your presence, especially if you're a guest with us. Thank you for coming and sharing your time with us. I want to to update you on some things that are coming, particularly for me, in the next next month. Uh, I want to go back to March for just a minute. Most all of you know that my wife uh, was diagnosed with a, an incurable brain tumor back in December. And uh, sure enough, as that thing played out, she passed away in March. And I took a little time off in March. The elders said to me, you take off all the time you want. Okay, that's their typical, generous, gracious nature. I took two weeks off, and in retrospect, I think I made a mistake. I think I should have taken more time at the beginning of uh, all of this than what I did. But I wanted to come back uh, for a couple of reasons. I wanted to come back as quickly as possible. Um, Number one, uh, you are my family. Uh, The disciples asked Jesus one time, we've left everything to follow you, what do we get? Well, he said, uh, you guys get to sit on thrones and judge Israel and all that. And anybody who leaves family, you're going to get a hundredfold back for doing that. Well, in my story, um, I left my family. My mother and my brothers live in Kentucky. My uh, daughter and her family live in Arkansas. And I'm it for Oklahoma. So, um, you have become my family. You are why I came back, or one of the reasons I came back. I wanted your encouragement. I wanted your support, because we're family. I also thought that my preaching would be therapeutic for me, and in some regards, it has been. I thought if I could get back and and get to work, it would be therapy for me to work through this. What I found out is I have been mistaken about that. Uh, There has been some therapeutic benefit to my preaching. But what I've realized, especially in the last few weeks, is that I have used my preaching, my work, to ignore the grief. Now, if you've been through the grief process, or if you are going through the grief process, you understand what I'm telling you. But I want the rest of you who've not been there yet, yet, because you will, I want you to understand and take a little uh, note from me that if you're going to work through the grief process, uh, you're going to have to work through it. Um, It's not an easy thing. And you cannot ignore it, because what happens when you ignore the grief process is that grief sabotages you when you're least expecting it. The last couple of weeks have been, and I don't know all the reasons, but have been incredibly difficult for me. The elders picked up on it, they understood it, so they came to me last week and they said, we want to invite you to take a sabbatical of four weeks. And just get away, do whatever you want to do, just try to work through this thing. I have mixed feelings about taking a month off to be away from you for that long. Um, My work ethic has pricked my conscience about this because... That's just not what I do. (laughs) Um, But selfishly, I'm going to accept the the sabbatical, which means the next four Sundays, I'm going to be out, and three of our elders and Gene are going to fill in for me over, over this time, and they are going to do extremely good jobs at preaching for you during this this time. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to do exactly during those four weeks. 
Uh, by the way, Home Before Dark, this may delay one week, the Home Before Dark class starting. I'm not sure about when exactly I'm going to be back, but we'll, we'll let you know about that for those of you that attend on Wednesdays at 4. Uh, but, but, uh, I am going to visit my daughter. I'm going to visit my mother. I am going to probably go to the beach for a few days. I grew up on the beach in northeast Florida. That is, uh, I'm like the sea turtle that goes back. <laughs> so, uh, so that's, that's kind of what I have in mind. After that, I don't know. I don't know. But I want to ask you to continue. And, and, and you guys have been prayerful uh, about me. Many of you are praying daily for me, and I cannot thank you enough for that. But I want you to pray for me specifically during these four weeks for safety as I travel, but also for addressing this grief head on. We, uh, I've been attending a grief share uh, support group at a church near here and uh, learned a lot about grief uh, during this, these uh, weeks that I've been involved in it. And this is one of the reasons that we're going to start grief share here. There are a number of you that are involved in the grief process here now, and uh, we want to we want to help you work through that. So when we start grief share, I hope you will participate if you are in need of that, um, because the the reality is it doesn't just go away. You've got to lean into it. You've got to fight it, and and that's what I want to do. I've also asked a friend of mine who is a uh, licensed counselor, to give me some one-on-one therapy, uh, grief recovery therapy, in regard to all of this. So I am stepping up my game to deal with this uh, for a number of reasons. Obviously, I want to feel better, but I also want to do better. I don't feel like I've given you 100% uh, since December. And so I uh, want to I wanna do better, I want to be better, I want to feel better, all those betters, and I want to uh, participate with you better. So I'm going to take a step back for a few weeks and um, kind of address this. And I, number one, want to thank the elders for their uh, sensitivity to me and their support of me and their kindness towards me. And I know from time to time... We, uh, we have a tendency to want to bash our elders uh, because, you know, they, they didn't make the decision I wanted them to make, and so they must be uh, uh, the worst thing that ever lived. And, and, and i got to tell you, these are the best guys I've ever worked with as elders. And uh, they are compassionate, they're generous, they're gracious, not only to me, but they are to you. And they have your best interest in mind as a congregation of God's people in this place. Uh, are they perfect? Are they infallible? No. We, we all have our flaws. The good thing that we can always do is be supportive and encouraging to them like they are to us. And so um, these, are, these are good-hearted men, and I'm grateful for them. Number two, I'm grateful to you, um, You are a terrific congregation. Your kindnesses to me have been overwhelming. Uh, Even before all the the, uh, problem with Linda, uh, you have been hugely encouraging to me, but especially from December 6th uh, last year on. Uh, It's been an amazing support that I've received from you. So I am grateful to you as a church and the tremendous ways that you have been kind to me, you've been encouraging to me, uh, even at times that I don't deserve the the encouragement that you've given me and the kind words, uh, you have, uh, you've, you've, you've risen above and beyond in my behalf. So keep praying for me and, uh, and I will, uh, I'm going to do my part to try to whip this and uh, be the kind of preacher that uh, 
that I, I want to be. You deserve a, a good preacher. Um, you deserve a better preacher than I am. And I want to ask you to continue praying for that aspect as well. And as I said before, if I'm not living up to your expectations, it's because you're not praying hard enough. <laughs> so, uh, so it's not my fault. <laughs> so, without further ado, we now have a word from our sponsor. Uh, I've been, I've been, I don't know if you've noticed, but in the last few weeks, I've been preaching to me about who our God is. Because in the grief process, one of the things that, uh, that really has occurred to me is to want to understand God better. Because there's a lot of confusion. I just, I'll confess to you, there's a lot of confusion in my mind about all of this, and especially in, uh, in Linda's process. Linda should still be alive, according to statistics. But uh, she died very quickly. Um, Diagnosed in December, she dies in March, what, three months? She should, have been, she should still be alive, according to um, medical statistics in regard to that tumor. So I've got a lot of confusion, and I've got a lot of questions. Um, I was angry with God for a little while, about that long. Uh, I expressed my anger to God, and then Job came to mind, and I thought, ooh, I better not, <laughs> better not go there. Uh, <laughs> So, um, so I kind of backed off from that, but I still have confusion over, over the issue. So I've been wondering, thinking about who God is. And this morning, I want us to think about God as the triumphant God. I don't understand everything about who He is. But I understand that He's the victor, He's the triumphant one, and I get to go along for the ride. And in my brokenness, whatever that may be, uh, I still get victory. So we started our lesson or our service this morning with Romans chapter 8. I'm not going to read the whole text again, but notice what shall separate us from the love of Christ. And he lists all these things, tribulation and so on and so on and so on. As it is written, for your sake we're killed all the day long. And then he says... No, in all these things, we are supra-conquerors. We are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. We have victory. We have a victory that doesn't come by our abilities. Guys, I'm broken. That's the reality. Passing of my wife was a blow. There are other issues that have come along in the last few weeks that have kind of added to the stresses of all of that, and I am in a broken place. But, but here's what I know. In spite of brokenness, I am more than a conqueror. And it's a great mystery how this works, but it's reality. It's the, the words of God telling us that Nothing is going to separate us from the love of Christ. And what I've come to understand, one of the things, is that there's nothing more important. Whatever your circumstance may be, whatever the issues of life that are coming your way, whatever the unfairness of life may throw at you, the injustice, any of it, The most important thing is that we remember we have the love of Christ. And nothing can take that from you. Nothing is going to remove Jesus' love for you. He's always going to love you. And the most important thing that we have is our relationship with God through Him. Now when Jason was leading us in the Lord's Supper a few minutes ago, he made a statement that just kind of jumped out at me. He said that we're not going to worry about eternity. We're not going to worry about eternal life. And that's right. You see, in Christ, we've got it. We get to go live with God forever. And there's nothing greater than that, is there? And you don't have to worry about that if you're in Christ. 
There is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You don't have to worry about it. It's not on the forefront of your mind all the time that you have to worry about whether you got it or you've lost it or if you're in Christ, it's yours. And there's nothing more important than that. We're going to look at a, an interesting thing that Paul and some of the other writers do as they uh, talk to us about Jesus. And we're going to 2 Corinthians chapter 2 if you'd like to turn there. There's more, more to this passage in verses 12 through 17, but, uh, but this is where we're going to start. Look at verse 12. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of Him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God, among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, a fragrance from death to death, to the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things? We're not like me, peddlers of God's Word, but as men of sincerity, commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Some of the New Testament writers, including Paul and Mark, took what was culturally relevant to their readers and made applications about Jesus in that relevance. Mark does it with the procession of Jesus going to the cross at Calvary. Paul does it here in what the Romans referred to was as a triumph. Look again. Thanks be to God who gives us or leads us in triumphal procession. Now for years that didn't mean a thing to me. Triumphal procession. But what this was, <clears throat> was the way that the Romans honored their generals. A general would go out and defeat a major enemy. And once he's defeated this great enemy of the Romans... He would come back to Rome in a procession. And for us, we'd call it a parade. But the Romans called it a triumph, a triumph, triumphe. And as they, uh, as they witnessed this, it would be to honor this general who has defeated the enemies. Now, as, as the general is coming to Rome, he sent out a herald ahead of him. And the herald starts waking everybody up to the reality that the general's coming and he's bearing good news. He's defeated the Gauls. He's defeated one of the great enemies of Rome. And he's coming. And so this herald preaches, proclaims this good news to the citizens of Rome. As the citizens start hearing the proclamation, they start making preparation for the coming of the general and his army. One of the things, as you see in the foreground of this Polaroid snapshot from the first century, one of the things that you see is the, uh, the fire burning. There was a special incense that the Romans used for this procession, this triumph. And they would burn this incense when they heard the good news of the coming general. And that incense would begin to flow throughout the city of Rome. And if you were on the other side of the city, you'd start smelling the incense that was burning. And you knew what that meant because it was a special aroma. And so you would begin making preparation, and they wound up with thousands of people lining the processional route in the city of Rome. Pretty soon, the general would enter the city through the ark, through the arch of triumph. There's one of those in Paris, other places. And he would enter into the city of Rome through this. He would be riding in a gold-plated chariot, and he would be, which would be pulled by 
two or more white horses, the sign of victory. And into the city he would come in triumphal procession. Behind him would be chained the military officers' leadership of the enemy he defeated. They would be brought into the city, and along with the two oxen, usually they were white, they would be brought into the city, and the oxen would be sacrificed to Jupiter, the god, the main god of the Romans, and the officers would be executed in sight of everybody at the procession. Behind them, in chains, would be the soldiers and many of the citizens of the places that they've conquered, and they would be brought in not to be put to death, but to be given roles as slaves, servants, in the, in the Roman Empire. They'd be bought and sold. Behind them would be all the bounty of the things that the army captured and brought into the city of Rome, all the wealth of the enemies that they've defeated. So the Romans didn't have to have a lot of taxes on them. They just went out and conquered somebody and brought the money home. And so you have this giant processional coming into the city of Rome, this great triumph of the Roman general. And Paul says, we are led in a triumphal procession. We're in this procession, not of a Roman general, but of Jesus, who has been the victor, who is the victor, who has conquered the enemy. And we get to participate in it. And one aspect of this is death to death, and another aspect is life to life. And by the way, as, as the procession enters the city, flowers were also strewn in the streets, and as, as the horses and men trampled on that, those flowers, another aroma arose. A fragrance. And that fragrance, Paul says, with the incense and the flowers, to one it's death, to another it's life. The Apostle Paul had been an enemy to Jesus. You remember the story as he was Saul of Tarsus and he was causing people to be imprisoned and, and mistreated because they followed Jesus. He took it on himself to, to go after Jewish people who had become followers of Jesus. He thought they were heretics and that they should be put to death. And so like with Stephen, Saul of Tarsus orchestrates the animosity towards the followers of Jesus. On the road to Damascus to do more damage, Jesus interrupts his journey, strikes him, knocks him to the ground, blinds him, and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul of Tarsus says, who are you? I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. What do you want me to do? Go into the city and it'll be told what you're to do. For days, Saul is fasting and praying. God sends Ananias to him, heals him, teaches him the gospel. And Saul arises and is baptized and washes away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord, and begins his ministry soon after as a servant of the Most High God. Saul of Tarsus died on the road to Damascus, spiritually. He was reborn to a new life. In fact, he tells us, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, by the, I live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me, and gave himself for me. There's death to death, life to life. I've been crucified with Christ. I died. Nevertheless, I live. But it's not me. It's Christ living in me. 
Here's the great problem for us as Western Christians. I don't want to let Jesus live in me. I want to be in charge. I want to be in control. I want to drive the chariot. But Jesus says that's not your job. Your job is to get in line behind me. And on the one hand, it is death. Those officers were going to die, literally die in Rome. And Jesus says to me, you've got to take up your cross, you've got to follow me, and it's got to be every day. You've got to die daily for me. Do you feel the, the problem? Do you feel the tension inside of you that says you've got to let go of you and let Jesus live in you? There's death to death and there's life to life. He reminds us in Romans 6 that when we are buried with him in baptism, it is a baptism into his death and we're raised to walk in newness of life. Life to life. We die, we're buried, we're resurrected to a new life in Christ. But also, in that new life, we're reminded of the role of the servant. Those guys that were behind the chariot who were not the officers, but were the soldiers and the citizens of the place that they conquered, that the Romans conquered, became servants, slaves of Rome. And Paul says in places like Romans 1 that he was a servant or a slave of Christ Jesus. How are you a slave, Paul? Called to be an apostle set apart for the gospel of God. One of the things that we do is that we, as servants of the Most High God, run out in front of the chariot of Jesus and we start telling people that the King is coming. The conquering King is coming. Make preparation because He's coming. So we're not done away with. We have a new role as servants of the, of the living God. Death to death. Life to life. That fragrance is there filling all in all. Now I took too long telling you about the next four weeks. So let me hit this very quickly and then we'll, we'll close our lesson this morning. I want you to notice three aspects of the triumph. Number one... Our triumph reminds us, the, the triumph of Jesus reminds us that in order to conquer, to be those more than conquerors, we must first be conquered. In order to, to understand this pro procession of victory, we are participating in His victory. It's not ours and it was not easy, but we need to learn submission instead of authority. Again, I want to drive the chariot. The problem is when I'm in charge, when I'm in control, when I'm driving the chariot, we get off track. I get off track. I make a mess. It's not in me who walks to direct my own steps. God's got to do that. And God's got to do that individually for each one of us, and He has to do it collectively for our congregation. We can't do it ourselves. We are dependent on Him and we have to learn that He is in charge and we have to learn that through the triumphal procession that we participate in with Him. There was a centurion in Capernaum who came to Jesus and said, My servant is ill, he's paralyzed, say the word and he'll be healed. And Jesus says, I'll come to your house. And he says, Oh no, you can't come to my house, I'm not worthy. And then he says, for I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I say to one, go, and he goes, to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I think there are two times that Jesus marvels at faith in the Gospels, and both times are to Gentiles, not Jewish people to Gentiles. But notice what the centurion said. I'm a man under authority, and I have authority. 
just like you, Jesus. I'm under authority to Rome. You're under authority to your Father. I can have authority because I've learned to follow. Jesus has authority because He's following His Father. In order to earn the ability to have authority, the ability to lead, we have to first learn to follow. We have to first learn to be under the authority of Jesus. That's what the triumph does. Death to death, life to life, following the victor in the chariot. Jesus is that victor. The centurion knew about that authority. He knew that he had it, and he knew that he was under it. And Jesus healed, of course, that great, that servant's, or that uh, centurion's servant. The second aspect of the triumph shows us that our victory is through his son, through the son. It's not your victory, it's his. He lets us participate in the victory. He has fought the battle. He leads us in His triumph, Paul says, because He has won the victory for us. Remember when David went down into the valley to fight Goliath? One of the things he says, This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you down and cut off your head. I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And then he goes on. And that this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. God's going to strike you down, Goliath. Not so that we praise David. Not so that we praise the armies of Israel. But so that the world will know of the God of Israel. And so that the people that were gathered there that day, one army on one side, one army on the other, shouting insults at one another, kind of like at a football game. You know, they're on both sides and they're, make, they're, they're, uh, they're tossing garbage at each other. And, uh, and so uh, David goes down in the battle and he says, this is, this is why I'm going to kill you, Goliath. So that the world will know and this assembly, these groups of people will know that God is the true God. That Elohim is true. And of course, we know the story. He takes down Goliath with the stone. And what do we know? God fought that battle. It wasn't David. David's just a, a kid. He wasn't a tried soldier. It was the hand of God on David. And there was victory there for what God did. And we remember that story. But God receives the honor of the glory for all of that. And by the way, that's what all this is about. This isn't about us. It's not about us and, and making a, a name for ourselves. It's not about fame and fortune and all those worldly kinds of things that we think about. It's not about reputation or, or any of that. This is all about glory to God. This is all about doing things that would, would honor Him. And so my challenge to you is find ways, not only in your prayers, but in your actions, find ways to do it for the glory of God. We ask sometimes incorrectly when we pray to God. I don't know how many prayers through the years I have asked God because I was selfish about something. God, I want you to do this, this, and this for me. What's the point? Me. For my ease, my comfort, my ego, my whatever. The right reason to pray about whatever it may be is so that God gets glory. That's who it's about. But the third thing, as we look at the triumph, is that we always have victory in Him. Notice again, thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession. 
Sometimes it doesn't feel like it, does it? Sometimes there are stresses and strains and problems and issues, and it doesn't feel like we're winning. It's one thing when everything's falling into place and your life is is just running along and you have happiness and joy and you can say, God's given me this great blessing and and I'm happy and and I, I have triumph because of Jesus. But then something happens and you hit a you hit a wall and you start thinking. What did I do wrong? What's the problem here? I don't have victory anymore. And that's not true. Because you always have victory. You always are going to be conquerors through Him who loves you. John said this, Everyone who's been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Let me close with some scenarios, and then uh, we're going to pray, and, uh, and we're going to sing an invitation song. I want you to notice what John says one more time. Everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. We sing a song, faith is the victory. And that's true. There is a victory in faith that is unequaled to anything else we can do. Let me illustrate. You go to the doctor. You have some tests to run. And the doctor says to you, I've got bad news. Your diagnosis is not good. It could be anything. It could be a cancer. It could be dementia, Alzheimer's. It could be some chronic illness. Whatever it might be, you receive that diagnosis. Many of you have heard those words. Let me ask you a question. Did you stop believing? You wouldn't be here if you stopped believing. No, 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 no. I didn't stop. In fact, I need it more than ever. Faith is the victory. Your faith gave you victory in that moment. In that hard time, when you heard those hard words, your faith stepped up. That's victory over that issue. Have you had a major disappointment? Something didn't turn out like you wanted it to and you were disappointed? Did you quit? Did you throw in the towel of faith and say, I've had enough, I'm done? No. Faith is the victory. Did you lose a loved one? If you haven't, you will. Or you will be the one to go. Did you quit? Did you give up? Did you say to God, I'm done? No. Faith is the victory. In fact, your faith increased in the process. Have stress on your job? Issues? Maybe you lost a job. Maybe you hit a, hit, a, hit a wall in your job. Some great difficulty has arisen. Some conflicts on the job. All kinds of issues can come up. Did you quit your faith? No. Faith is the victory. Conflicts in the family? No, I didn't quit. Faith is the victory. In this triumph, this procession, that we participate in. It involves our faith. Faith in the one who's driving the chariot. Faith in the one who says, I have overcome the world and you will too. Stick with me. See it through to the end. We are in essence playing out the clock. We have won. But between now and then, we're going to have issues. 
And Jesus says, your faith in him, in me, will overcome the world. Let's stand and pray. Our Father in heaven, we honor your name today, giving you thanks for the God that you are. What other God would put on flesh and live among us? What other God would send his one and only Son to be mistreated and to be uh, humiliated and, and, and killed? in the manner that he was. Father, you have raised him from the dead. And in our life before Jesus, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. But because of him, we've been raised to walk in newness of life. And we praise you for that. This is the greatest gift we can imagine because you live in us and you work through us and you honor us by your presence. And Lord, help us to honor you by our lives, by our faith that will bring glory to you and the battles that you have fought on our behalf. You are ahead of us. You are fighting the fight so that we can finish the course and keep our faith forever with you. Thank you for our time. Lord, just walk with us, keep our eyes on you, because without you, we have nothing. We are nothing. But with you, we have everything, and we are more than conquerors through Jesus, who loved us, and he gave himself for us, and it is through him that we pray. Amen. Our custom is to offer an invitation at the end of a sermon. I don't know, but what somebody may want to respond publicly this morning, we, we invite you to do that. If you'd like to put him on in baptism, this is a good opportunity. If you have prayer requests, this is a good time for that also. So we're going to sing, and if you need to come, come now.